Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering. And this is module 11, where we discuss how to characterize the frequency spectrum of a random signal. So being able to determine what a signal looks like in the frequency, frequency domain is a very important thing for electrical engineers to be able to do. We're looking at signals spectrum or spectra all the time. So um, for example, we might have a random communication signal and we want to see what it looks like in the frequency domain to determine whether or not it'll fit through a channel. Um, we might want to look at a random control signal or a random instrumentation signal in the frequency domain because we're designing a filter for that signal or we want to evaluate the effect of filtering on that signal. And so a lot of the concepts that we're going to be using when we are sort of deriving the, the method for looking at random signals in the frequency domain actually originate with deterministic signals. And so the first few slides of this, um, this module are going to focus just on the plain old deterministic signals that you would have seen in your undergraduate signals and systems course. And it will um, and I will basically kind of be hopefully reviewing some concepts that are um, familiar to you from, from your undergraduate work. And the first few things I want to talk about are, are quite fundamental, and it's just um, the power of, the si of a signal and the energy of a signal. And so let's assume that we have a, uh, a complex, I say complex random signal here, but this doesn't have to be random. It can really be any signal at all. Um, assume that we have a complex signal x of t that varies as a function of time, and the instantaneous power of that signal is defined as the magnitude squared of x of t. And this comes from the formula that power is equal to voltage squared divided by um, the resistance that the voltage is across. And we don't have a resistance in this formula for instantaneous power because we assume that we're, the voltage is, the signal is basically across a, a one ohm resistor. And this one ohm resistor normalization is a pretty common thing that you see in uh, uh, particularly communications, but also signal processing in general. Okay, so the units for instantaneous power are watts, right? Which are just joules per second. And so if we want energy, of course, we need to multiply power by time. And so let's say that dt is a very small, infinitesimally small time, steps, time step that has units of seconds. And if that's the case, then instantaneous energy E is equal to instantaneous power multiplied by this very small time step. And the total energy of the signal is just the integral of the instantaneous energy from minus infinity to um, positive, positive infinity. And we say that if this total energy is less than infinity, we're dealing with a finite energy signal. Otherwise, we're dealing with an infinite energy signal, obviously. Um, and so probably you would have dealt mostly with um, finite energy signals in your, your undergraduate work. Infinite energy signals come from, or are basically signals that we assume stretch from uh, minus infinity to plus infinity on the time axis. And these are typically very long signals. They might be a very long noise signal or a very long kind of random bit stream or random bit sequence or something like that. And um, we go from minus infinity to plus infinity in theory, just to recognize the fact that there's no logical sort of beginning or ending um, to the signal. So infinite energy signals actually um, arise in electrical engineering all the time. Again, random bit sequences or um, very long noise signals that don't sort of have a logical beginning and a logical end. Um, and in the next few slides, we'll talk about how to deal with infinite energy signals. But um, for now, Let's assume that we're dealing with a finite energy signal where energy, total energy is less than infinity. And if we are, then we can define the Fourier transform pair for them. And so the uh, 
frequency spectrum of our finite energy signal 5f is just equal to the Fourier transform of x. And of course, we can recover x from the inverse Fourier transform of its spectrum. Now, since we're dealing with you know, concepts of energy and power here, an important theorem to mention is Parseval's theorem. And Parseval's theorem just states that the total energy of the signal, which is equal to the magnitude, the integral of the magnitude squared of the signal in the time domain, is equal to the integral of the magnitude squared of that signal spectrum in the frequency domain. Now it's actually reasonably straightforward to um, prove Parseval's theorem. So we know total energy is just equal to the magnitude squared of x of t, which is just x of t multiplied by its conjugate. And in the next line, we sub in the inverse Fourier transform for, um, or in the very next line, we represent the conjugate of x of t by its the inverse Fourier transform of its spectrum. And since we're using the conjugate, the spectrum is conjugated and rather than there being um, e to the j 2 pi ft, it's e to the minus j 2 pi ft, that's because of the conjugation. Then we just um, rearrange terms a little bit. We pull the, um, the conjugate of the frequency spectrum out front. We take x of t and we put it inside the integral. We put it up against um, e to the minus j 2 pi ft change positions for dt and df. And if you look at this term, this is just the Fourier transform of x of t. So this is equal to um, just the plain old spectrum of x of t. And so now we have phi of f multiplied by phi of f, which is just equal to the integral of the magnitude squared of phi of f. And so we have the magnitude squared of phi of f is equal to the total energy of the signal E. So the energy density of a signal, or what we call the energy density of a signal, is just equal to um, the magnitude squared of its frequency spectrum. And so we call it energy density because we know that the total energy is equal to the magnitude squared of phi. Therefore, it's equal to just the integral of phi e of f and the units of energy density are therefore joules per hertz. So that's the units on the y-axis of an energy density plot. So as I mentioned earlier, um, engineers actually do work with both finite energy signals and infinite energy signals. So a finite energy signal is a signal with a logical sort of starting and ending, if you like. So a great example of a finite energy signal is just a single pulse, maybe a single triangular pulse. And then obviously the area under that waveform is, uh, um, is finite. However, the practical signals that we deal with that have um, infinite energy are ones that are basically long sequences. Um, so if we want to model, as I was saying, a communication signal that's a series of ones and minus ones, um, oops. You know, we don't in this long sequence necessarily want to model the logical start point and end point of it. So we just model it as continuing from or starting at minus infinity and continuing on to plus infinity. Now, obviously everything in our universe has, you know, a, a start point and an end point. We live in a causal universe. Um, however, this is just a, a mathematical model or modeling um, convention that we use. And so um, if we have an infinite energy signal like this, as long as the amplitude of that signal is finite, it actually has a finite average power. And so we approach them from the perspective of average power. So the average power of an infinite energy signal is defined as the integral of the magnitude squared 
of a truncated version of that signal. And the truncated version is just the infinite um, signal multiplied by the rectangular function that is equal to plus one from t by two to minus t by two. And so because we truncate the signal, that means it's got finite energy. Um, and we just normalize by one over the, um, the pulse duration, and that gives us average power. And then we just do this over a really, really long time window. So we take the limit of t as t goes to, uh, as t goes to infinity. Now, another advantage of um, working with the truncated version of the signal is that it means um, its Fourier transform exists. So if we truncate it, um, it has finite energy. And so we can def define the spectrum of the truncated signal. And that's why that subscript T is still there, which is just the Fourier transform of X of T. And remember, X of T is the um, infinite duration signal multiplied by that rectangular function. So Using um, Parseval's theorem, we note that we can calculate our average power by integrating the spectrum of the signal, um, the magnitude squared of the spectrum, because the integral of the magnitude squared of a signal spectrum is the same thing as integrating it, um, its magnitude squared with respect to time. And so that means we can define something called the power density. And the power density, um, phi p, P for power and then T still because we're still dealing with the truncated version of the signal. Um, the power density is basically just equal to um, the energy density multiplied by 1 over T, right, and um, which is just equal to the 1 over T times the magnitude squared of the spectrum of the truncated signal. And thanks to this 1 over T factor, which has units of 1 over seconds, the um, the units of power density are watts per hertz. Which makes sense when we look at this integral here because we're determining average power in watts by um, integrating 1 over t multiplied by the spectrum, which is equal to our our power density, right? So if the area under the power density is equal to average power, then um, the units of the power density has to be equal to uh, watts per hertz. I should also mention at this point that um, many of you, or at least some of you, will be doing um, experimental work in the lab, and chances are you will um, have a chance to use an instrument called a spectrum analyzer. And a spectrum analyzer shows you what a signal looks like in the frequency domain. And basically what the spectrum analyzer is giving you is power density. Because if you look on the y-axis of the display of a, um, a spectrum analyzer, it's typically in units of watts per hertz or sometimes um, dBm. Per hertz, right? Where dBm is dB relative to one milliwatt. So it's some some sort of unit of power per hertz on the y-axis of a of a spectrum analyzer. Okay, so now we have the tools necessary to start dealing with random signals or stochastic processes. Now, most of the stochastic processes that we will be dealing with are um, typically infinite energy signals, and so um, we would want to work with uh, the power density of those signals. Um, however, the problem fundamentally with um, dealing with a stochastic process is that every time you perform your random experiment, the waveform changes. And so if we were just to take the power spectrum of a realization of the stochastic process, we would get a picture and we could do that, except the picture would change the next time we um, performed the random experiment and, go, and got a different realization of the, uh, of the process. And so basically what we would like is a picture of what the waveform looks like in the frequency domain on average. And that's exactly what we do. That's exactly what power spectral density is. Um, so the power spectral density for a stochastic process, and we'll 
denote uh, PSD as um, S of F, is basically just the expected value of the power spectrum of that signal as we take T to infinity. And so what we're going to do first is we're going to um, come up with an expression for the expected value of the power density and we'll work with it a little bit and try to simplify things and then we'll take um, the limit of t to infinity as sort of our last step. So starting out here we've got the expected value of our power spectrum and it's the magnitude squared of the power spectrum and so we expand this out to have one integral um, for the power spectrum and a second integral for the conjugate of that power spectrum. Both of these, or sorry, th these are um, Fourier transform uh, integrals and alpha and beta are um, variables of integration with respect to time, right? So I just didn't use T because we've got two integrals going on here, but these are basically just the Fourier transforms of the time domain um, signal these actually should be, we should have the subscript T here because these are the, the truncated versions of the signal. Um, then we take the expected value of the whole expression. Now, what we can do with the expected value operator is that um, whenever we're working with integrals or any sort of expression where we've got random things and deterministic things, we can kind of shrink the expected value operator so that it surrounds only the random uh, parts of our expression. And so really the only two random things are x of t and x of t conjugate. And so in the second step, what we do is we just rearrange our integral so the two x's um, are beside each other. And again, the, those should have the subscript um, t and the expected value operator shrinks, so it just surrounds those two um, signals. And then everything else, the integrals, the exponential term, which is not random, is outside of the expected value. But we can recognize that um, the expected value of a, of a stochastic process multiplied by its conjugate is just the autocorrelation of that signal. And assuming that we're dealing with a wide sense stationary process, we can write the autocorrelation as just the difference between our time sample point alpha and our time sample point beta. And so what we end up with is a double integral that um, with respect to alpha and beta, but both of the terms, um, the autocorrelation function and the exponential are a function of alpha minus beta. And so that means um, this is a good candidate for a variable substitution in order to simplify our integral. So just in general, if we have any function, g, that's a function of alpha minus beta, and we're integrating with respect to alpha and beta, if we substitute in tau for alpha minus beta and then kind of work through it, you can show that the variable is equal to t multiplied by um, the in integral of g of tau from t to t multiplied by 1 minus the magnitude of tau over t. Now, what we're basically going to do is we're going to take the, um, in the expression on the previous slide, we're going to make the variable substitution tau equal to alpha minus beta. We're going to use this identity as a simplification. And I'm going to define the function lambda tau to be equal to 1 minus magnitude of tau over t, just to sort of simplify things. And what we come up with, if you sort of do all this substitution, is you end up with the expected value of our power spectrum equal to 1 over t times t, the integral of minus t to t of our autocorrelation function as a function of tau, right, because we put in Alpha, or alpha minus beta was replaced by tau, e to the minus um, j 2 pi f tau multiplied by lambda tau d tau. So we've um, converted our double integral down to a single integral and we've um, considerably, uh, considerably simplified things.
So now finally we're in a position to determine power spectral density. So power spectral density S is equal to the limit of capital T approaching infinity of the average value of our the magnitude squared of our truncated power spectrum. So if we take the simplified expression for um, the average power spectrum from the previous slide, we sub it in, we see that the one over T, whoops, the one over T and the T cancels out. Um, this function lambda goes to one. We can see up here as we take T to infinity because this denominator gets really big. And the expression that we're left with is just equal to the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. And so basically when everything is said and done, if we want to determine the power spectral density of a random signal, we take the Fourier transform of its autocorrelation function. And as long as that, um, as long as the, uh, the process is wide sense stationary. And so this is a really elegant, easy to apply um, result. And remember, power, all power spectral density is, is basically an average version of the power spectrum. So basically what our random signal looks like um, on average in the frequency domain. And hopefully this makes intuitive sense because um, we noted when we first introduced autocorrelation function that autocorrelation, the autocorrelation function of a signal is can kind of capture the rate of change of the signal, right? So if two, if the signal is changing very slowly, um, the autocorrelation function is a very gradual function. And so its Fourier transform would be um, relatively narrow band or have most of its energy concentrated at the lower, um, lower frequencies. If um, a random signal changes very suddenly, its autocorrelation function tends to be much sharper. And then when you take the Fourier transform of that sharp autocorrelation function, you'll find um, the energy of the signal or the power of the signal spread across a wider range of frequencies. And on the topic of power, the area under the power spectral density of a random signal X equals its average power. And to prove this, we know that average power, the average power of a stochastic process is just equal to the expected value of um, its magnitude squared, which is equal to the autocorrelation function at a um, time offset of zero. Now, we've seen that the power spectral density is the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. So it makes sense that the autocorrelation function is equal to the inverse Fourier transform of the power spectral density. And so if average power is equal to the autocorrelation function with a value of zero or a tau equal to zero, this is equal to the inverse Fourier transform of the power spectral density with a tau of zero. And of course, e to the zero is just equal to one. And so this exponential term goes to one and we're left with just the integral of the power spectral density. And so average power is equal to the area under the power spectral density. And so that means um, power spectral density, similar to power spectrum, also has units of watts per hertz, which makes sense because all we did was average the power spectrum. So averaging the power spectrum should not change its units. And now just a couple of examples. So um, actually, you know, now that we're done sort of all that work deriving the expressions and hopefully understanding what they mean, um, the actual sort of calculations for determining the power spectral density are reasonably straightforward. So we just determine the, the autocorrelation waveform. And once we have that, we calculate its Fourier transform. And something I should mention is that in this class, um, I'm not going to be pushing too hard with the complexity of the Fourier transforms. So all of the problems that I give you, you should be able to solve using a standard table of Fourier transforms. Now, in some cases, there might be combinations of Fourier transforms from the table that you have to work with, but um, there should be no solving of incredibly complex um, integrals or anything like that.
And so just a couple of examples on this slide. The first one is a very standard um, type of waveform that we work with a lot, and that's a, a white waveform. Um, so let's consider, in this example, we have white noise with zero mean and an autocorrelation function that's basically equal to a delta function multiplied by one half n naught, and one half n naught is um, sort of a kind of typical notation that you see in um, communications theory. And so the Fourier transform of a delta function is just equal to one, and so the power spectral density, and I'm expressing this in terms of um, omega, but you can also, uh, I, I, the Fourier transform table that I'll be providing you with in this class is in terms of f. You can really work with in either domain, I don't mind. Um, so the, the Fourier transform of a delta function is just equal to a constant. And so this means that the power spectral density of white noise is basically a um, is basically flat. And so if we were to draw the power spectral density in the frequency domain, it would have infinite bandwidth and a height of one half n naught. And so theoretically the um, white noise is um, an infinite power signal. It has an infinite average power. Um, however, in any practical situation when we're dealing with white noise, we'll typically be passing it through a system, some kind of band-limited system that will effectively limit the bandwidth of the white noise to, uh, to something finite. And there's a, a problem on the assignment that sort of goes along in this, in this direction. Uh, the second example is a sinusoid with uniformly distributed random phase. So we, we looked at this, uh, at this sinusoid um, a couple of modules ago, and we found that the autocorrelation function was equal to one half cos omega naught um, tau, and the Fourier transform of a cosine is straight out of the the Fourier transform tables, and it's equal to the delta function or two shifted delta functions, where um, I guess if we're dealing with omega, we have one delta function centered at the oscillation, positive oscillation frequency, and another delta function centered at the negative oscillation frequency. And hopefully this is um, satisfying because uh, the Fourier transform of a deterministic cosine wave is um, just two shifted delta functions. And so we find all of the power of the, the cosine wave concentrated at the frequency of oscillation.